So Android market for developers. You guys have all been learning today about the best way to make your Android applications, about Ice Cream Sandwich, and all these great features. This talk is about the market. The new Android market features that rolled out across the world, that new Android market which looks much better with the feature graphics in it. And it's about the features of that market for users and for developers. So we've got two sections to this talk. The first section of the talk is about the new market client and the users and uh, the new lists in the market. And the second section of the talk is about the Android market features that we pushed onto all the handsets for developers like yourselves to access. So the Android market, where did it all begin? It began with the G1. Did the G1 make it to Israel? Yeah, who had the G1? Unofficially. G1, nice. And from the G1, we started to build up the market. Lots and lots of devices launched. And from there, we showed this video at Google I.O. Now, I want someone to take that Android with the jetpack and go and talk to the parachute guys so I can have a little Android which fires into the sky and then parachutes down to any location. That would be cool, right? Using the ADK. So we went from there at 100 million activations, and that grew. It clearly grew quite a lot. You saw in the keynote this morning, we had some new figures, 190 million Android devices. And that 190 million is a figure that represents devices with the Android market on, the Google Experience devices, the devices that check in with our servers. 550 unique SKUs of devices from 48 OEMs, 277 carriers in 137 countries, and 8 billion app installs to go along with it. I'll skip through these a little bit quicker because they were in the, uh, they were in the keynote this morning. So we've seen the rate of activations has been growing as well. But not only that, the reach across the world. At the start of last year, America had more than 75% of the Android market, along with those uh, Verizon Droid campaigns that were running during the Super Bowl. And now you can see America's less than 40% of the global market. So that's a good shift for us, a good shift for all of us in Europe, Middle East, Africa, Russia, the places where Android is now shipping in more and more volumes and the app installations per device. As the devices have been getting faster and faster, the new markets, the browsing, people are expecting more premium applications, and they're installing more applications on those devices. And it's an even bigger disparity when you look at the paid applications. There was this rumor previously that people didn't pay for applications on Android. But now you can see with the invention of Honeycomb, and now with Ice Cream Sandwich as well, people are paying for applications on Android. People are paying for premium experiences. People are making a lot of money in the Android market. But I say to you then, how can you write a single application which runs on 550 different devices with different screen sizes, different GPS cameras, these things? And of course you say, because you will know, you use the Android framework. It's what it's there for. You have resources, layouts, and these things. But what is it? that makes the Android framework work on all of those devices. They'd have different chipsets, different screens, all these things. Does anyone know how we ensure that the Android framework works on those devices? Maybe, uh, do I have anything? An Android USB key? Does anyone know how we make these? Uh, make sure that the Android framework works really well on all 550 devices? Has it got a name? What's the name for those standards? One person? Uh, OK. This is mine. It's the compatibility test suite. Did anyone say that? Yeah? <laughs> Come and see me afterwards. So uh, the compatibility test suite, it's on the open source, source to slash compatibility. It's developed in the open. 
It's 13,000, more than 13,000 tests now that's run on every single device that gets the, the with Google or Google, Google, Google experience branding. And you can download it, and you can run it, and you can see the tests. I haven't memorized them all. But what it means, as I say, it's developed in the open. So if you're using the published Android APIs, and you put your application on a device, and it doesn't run as you expect it, you can check these tests. And if there isn't one there, you can submit a new test to the test suite. And then for all new Android devices, if your test is accepted, all new Android devices from then on will also have to pass your test before they get the Google Experience branding. And it's not just Google using these. Other Android manufacturers outside of the, the Google kind of Android range. Um, Umbrella also run this to ensure that your applications are running on their devices. Oh, live questions. Don't we have what? A base? No, as long as the test suite passes. It's quite hard to define hardware in some of these uh, circumstances. If the, the, the test suite passes, then you're OK. So the Android market is open for business. Hopefully quite a few of you. How many of you have published an app in the Android market? Whoop, whoop. That's quite a lot. Cool. So you know the flow. I can skip through this. You can publish it as many times as you want. You can update as many times as you want. Users like this. They like feeling loved. You control the price and the distribution. It's all instant. One of those things, if you think about updating as often as you want, if you get a bug report into your application, we have supported devices list. So you can, first of all, you can take that device out of your distribution list. But then you can create an update and push, push it into the market. And within a couple of hours after pushing it into the market, it's live on all those devices. You don't have to wait a week for it to get verified. You can do the updates as you want them, push them out, and all your users benefit very, 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 very quickly. And whilst you're publishing, you get this option, which is a strange option, because it says, this feature will soon be deprecated. Please don't use it. But it does say, would you like to copy protect your application? And the guys who have published an app will have seen it, and they'd have looked at this dialog and thought, should I copy protect it or not? And actually, this particular copy protection is forward locking, DRM forward lock, which isn't very useful on Android since about the advent of rooted phones, things like this. It doesn't help so much. So we're deprecating it because uh, it was useful at the start. But right now, all it does is it means that your, your application isn't distributed to all devices. So instead, now we have the licensing service, the license verification library. So I certainly recommend not having this turned on. And we'll run through the license service in a minute. Users of the new Android market can find your applications in more and more and more ways. Not only these ways, but through web search as well. If you have your brand on the internet and people are using mobile search to find it, they can, you can check your Google Analytics and see what percentage of the searches for your application, for your website, sorry, are done on the, the mobile internet from mobile devices. And then you put an application in the Android market. We also index the Android market now in the Google search listings. So you're automatically going to drive traffic to your Android market listing if you have people searching on the internet for your application already. And increasing the amount of searches generally for your application will increase the amount of traffic into the Android market for your application. So you get the users in. They've done the download. Maybe they do the NFC share to find it, the Android Beam it works. And then you need to track your users. Clearly, we recommend using Google Analytics to track your users. It's one way of giving data to maybe your marketing and sales teams. They can log into the Google Analytics account and see all that data. It's also another way of augmenting the data that you're receiving from your application. You go to Google Analytics and grab the library, and then you can get a tracker object. And you do tracker.start. And from that point on, you can track anything you want. You can track button clicks, page views, exceptions. It's really useful data to have. And when you call dispatch, maybe on your on pause method, it does that synchronize with the server and sends all that data up. The kind of report you get is what you're used to seeing from the websites. Quite simple to put this library in. It does require the internet permission. So maybe you want to explain why in your, uh, in your description. And then you get this kind of breakdown. 
This is from Rito Meyer's earthquake application. And you can see on his breakdown, the first item is refresh earthquakes. 24, 25 million clicks on the refresh earthquakes button, which suggests immediately to me that he should be doing auto refresh because that's a lot of button clicks he could be saving. And once he's done auto refresh, he can spend some time looking at all the parsing errors, of which he has 3 million of. So you do that. Users have discovered your application, and you're tracking them through the flow. You know the installs, the uninstalls, details of the application. But you want more. You want your application ranked inside the Android market. So how does Android market ranking work? Well, it's a set of signals. And it's a set of signals that's far too long to list on a slide and far too complicated. But they're the kind of signals that you would expect them to be, the kind of signals that we take meaning that your application is high quality and that users want your application. These engagement figures, how long does your application stay installed for? What are the ratings? And they change. If suddenly you do an update and your application ratings start going up and up and up, our algorithms know that. It's not all about the history. And the same for you know, the active installs, how long the user's engagement factors. It's the kind of things you could expect. And they're trying to model two use cases. We're trying to model the users who have just bought an Android phone for the first time and want the best apps. And we're also trying to model the users like all of us who have had an Android phone for quite a while and are looking for the new and fresh apps. That's what the whole new Android market was about. So to improve your ranking, you want to think about what these signals that we're, we're using are to rank the application, and then try and improve them. And interestingly, one of those signals that we did roll out across the world now is local. So if your application is very popular in a specific country, maybe not even in your own country, it will raise through the rankings in that country. And this can explain why sometimes you get bumps in sales or bumps in downloads. Unfortunately, we don't give you a user interface right now to find out where you're ranked in each country. And it can be the source of many partner calls for me. But it's something that we've fed back into the Android market team that's very important and that developers want. They want to know where they're ranked in every country. They want to be able to provide feedback to users. They want to be able to explain why they're using certain permissions. So there's a new version of the Android market publisher site being designed at the moment. And we're feeding back from our partners these kind of things to try and get them included in the new Android market publisher site. I assume you've read the slide. Target appropriately. Make sure your app doesn't get installed on hardware that it doesn't support, things like that. And then we have the payment models in the Android market, the free, the in-app billing, advertising, and paid. And in-app billing is the killer here. If you go to market.android.com right now, and have a look at the list that's called top grossing applications. All of them are now free. Last week, it was 9 out of 10. The week before that, 8 out of 10. But now, all of the highest grossing applications are free applications that use in-app billing. And that's because they can pull a user in. They can get a user to trust them. A user sees how high quality this application is and how much they need it in their life. And then you charge them. You charge them for upgrades or unlocks the different things. Some companies get very, very creative about the in-app billing options now. Wind Up Night is a good example. At the end of the second level of Wind Up Night, it gives you a one-off chance in the entire game. You never get the option again to unlock all the levels for a one-off fee. And this drives users. They think, actually, if I don't do this now, it will maybe charge me more later. People are getting creative about how to create money in the Android market. And then we get the featuring promotion slots. The new Android market is not about our brand at all. Our brand, the Android market brand, is in the very top left corner, and you hardly notice it at all. It's all about your brands. It's all about the great big feature graphic in the middle, or Superman. And when you're making that feature graphic, you have to be aware that it's going to get scaled down onto the, the phone screen as well. So please don't use small text in it, or screenshots, things that when you scale them down, don't look too good because it makes the featuring team's job a little bit harder. But one thing you will notice is throughout the year, the Android market will appear themed. And the only way that we can theme the Android market is if you theme your applications. So during Halloween, you get more pumpkins on the homepage because people who have taken an application and launched it 
but are aware of these things, update their graphics throughout the year. Because users and the featuring team are both looking for relevance when they're looking for applications. They want Christmassy applications at Christmas and Thanksgiving applications at Thanksgiving. You may live here or I may live in London, but it's still worth targeting the American audience for their big holidays and getting featured in these countries where the holidays are. And if you don't believe me, check it. Each time there's a holiday season, the Android market, like two or three out of the top five applications will be themed. And then throughout the list of featured applications, you'll see things dotted around, which we've chosen because it makes the Android market look that much more relevant. And we can only do that with your brands. So things to look for when we review applications. There were the lists that Nick gave before about uh, the UI, keeping it smooth, not using the UI thread, things like that. And now, more directly, we want that sense of premium applications. We want that sense that this is an application that many, many users will want. We'll look at your ratings and you know, how you've been growing over time. Seasonality, as I was pointing out a second ago. I wish I'd taken a screenshot from Halloween just to, to really emphasize it. But. And then we're definitely not looking for straight ports of other platforms. I mean, it's one thing that highlights immediately. If we open an application and there's a back button in the top left corner, or whatever, the little tabs at the bottom, things that rounded corners on boxes, and it just looks like your applications come straight off a different platform, then we would wish that you'd put slightly more effort into the UI being more Android. So the new lists on Android, you must all have the new Android market client by now with the new list, the trending list, feature uh, free, top free, uh, top paid, top grossing, these new lists. And I'm sure you can understand why we had to do that. Previously, we just had the just in list and then the top free and paid. And the just in list was fine when the uh, influx of applications to the Android market was only one every five minutes. But when that grew and grew to 2,000 or plus applications every day, you'd develop your application, you'd publish it, you'd check on the screen, and it was already in the third position, 10th position, gone. So the just-in list became quite useless. I know you could guarantee your application would be in it, and I know some developers liked to republish or do an update every two weeks to get that little bump that you got when you went to the top of the just-in list, but the effect of it was getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and it wasn't an effective place for anyone to find anything. It was very random. So we built some new lists. And the first thing about the Andro new Android market is if you can get yourselves promoted through viral promotions, marketing, anything like that, to drive the initial bump of sales, you're more likely to get in the trending list. And the trending list is the easiest place to get into. The trending apps list is supposed to be looking at that just-in list and looking for the ones which you would have been trying to find the applications that are doing, uh, getting some traction. And it's relative to the other applications that are published around the same time. But it's all about discovering new applications that maybe won't make it to the top new free. But maybe they will because they were in there. If you do get to trending, then you stand an even better chance of getting to the top new free and paid list. And trending is that stepping stone. So in those first 30 days of your application, you could launch the application. Give it four or five days to see the kind of feedback you're getting. Make sure there's no big bugs on any devices. And then, if you have a launch plan, execute the launch plan and try and get in the trending list. Because that's your stepping stone to the top new free and paid, top free and paid. If you get to the top free and paid, you're way more visible to the featuring team. Then you get the users also viewed and also installed sections. Again, good places for you to get some promotion. Personal recommendations. The top grossing category that I mentioned earlier, which is full of in-app billing applications right now, followed by the editor's choice badge, which once given to you, you get to keep, but it puts you in this one category for about 30 days. Very, very, very limited set of applications ever get the editor's choice badge. The top developer badge, and then the Android win. You get right to the top. The top developer badge is an interesting one. Um, we're on the lookout all the time for top developers. It's to signal to users that it's um, a developer or development house 
that's created consistently creating good Android applications that get a lot of downloads and have high star ratings and are compatible and that we trust. And we'll have communicated with them and we'll give them the badge and then users can trust them. But anybody is up for a top developer badge. Top developer badges are done on a ranking system based on, as I say, number of installs, ratings, things like that. So if you think you've had many applications, like four, all have to be four and a half star and above, millions of installs, things like that, and you're consistently doing it, but you've never been spotted, then you should get in touch with us because we obviously made a mistake. So that's the end of the Android market features for consumers and how you can publish your application. The next section is the Android market for developers. So whilst we were pushing this new market out and the previous new market, we put some new features on the devices for you as well. And the Android market client runs services that you can talk to. The first of those, actually, this didn't go onto the client. This was rolled out into the Android market publisher site for you was multiple APKs. Multiple APK listings allow you to have one Android listing in the market and put multiple APKs in it. Is anybody using multiple APK? We've got one. So it can simplify the adoption of new platform features. If you've written a legacy application, especially if it was for phones, and then you want to do something for tablets, and you don't mind having a code break, you can upload the phone version of the application and the tablet version of the application as separate APKs and distinguish in the manifest file which is supposed to go to which. And the Android market will serve the correct application to the right device. It means that all your reviews end up in one place, all your users go to one place, you only have one place to manage. But we kind of hope most of you never have to use it. It's just there for convenience if you do. The main reason we would suggest using it is if you're doing 3D games with texture compression. So right now, we have a file size limit in the Android market of 50 megabytes. And if you've got 40 megabytes of textures and you want to support multiple um, GPUs with multiple texture compression formats, you're going to have trouble. So this now means with multiple APK, you can keep your files as small as they need to be for any one device and have different APKs with the different textures in them. And the Android market ships the right ones to the right devices when they're downloading it. And if you're going to do that, a good way of doing it is to have a library project. You create your project in Eclipse. You tick the little box in properties that says, this is a library, and then build projects on top of it, saying, use the library. And then you can just override anything you want. You can override the textures. You can override the layouts. But it means when you come to export your project as APK files, you don't have to mess with the manifest. You can have a nice, consistent build environment, which is generating multiple APK files And as we say, many developers won't have to use it. And we'd still much prefer you have a single application file which runs on every single device. It will make everybody's lives easier. But clearly, that's not always possible. And there are reasons why you may not want to. So if you're using the XML for your Android manifest, you have the one for tablets. You can say supports large screens and extra large screens only in one APK file. And in the other APK file, you can say support small and medium screens. And you upload these two APK files to the Android market in one listing, and you end up using multiple APK. So the second of the Android market services was the licensing service, the LVL, License uh, Verification Library. And this is a service on the Android market which lets you ask the Android market whether the user has bought your application and paid for it or whether they've pirated it. So there's always going to be pirates. On every single platform ever, there's going to be pirates. And we provide a set of tools which help you minimize the effect of piracy on your revenues. So you get the casual pirates. These guys. These guys are going to look for a pirated version of your application. And if they find it, they'll install it. When they've installed it, your application is going to check with the Android market service whether they've purchased it. And they haven't. 
So you can throw up a dialogue that says, license check failed, get out of here, which isn't very polite. And maybe you should think again, because these guys have gone to the trouble of finding the pirated version of your application, maybe playing it a bit, and it clearly implies they want it. So instead, you could send them back to the Android market. When the check fails, send them to the Android market, say, look, you want my application, just pay for it. And this works surprisingly effectively in an upsell method. The library, the LVL library. Uh, LVL and in-app billing are done in a way that we generate a public private key pair for you. And we keep the private key on our servers where no one can get at it. And we give you your public key through the Android market publisher site settings. So you can pull it down from there and then use it to read the messages that the market sends you. Like this. We have the public key. We give you your private key. You can put it in your application, or you can keep it on your own servers if you want total security. Then the LVL talks to the market's licensing service, which talks to the servers, securely comes back with this message that gets passed straight back down to your application. And there you go, which seems simple. Why doesn't everybody just do this? And what happens if you do just do this? Well, we produce some uh, sample code for the license verification library. And as you can imagine, um, with Dalvik, things like languages that can be decompiled, sample code can be found relatively easily, great big chunks of identical code. So the pirates went away, and they wrote a tool. And the tool looks at APK files, looks for the sample code, pulls it out, and makes it always return true. And it's automated. So if you are going to do LVL, the first thing to do is not use the sample code exactly as it is. Make some changes. Use reflection. Change entry and exit points. Make it not debuggable. If you want to go all out, you could use reflection, maybe even use the NDK. One really, really nice trick is if you do that, and you change the code, and you put it in your application, also include our sample code as well. Because they'll run their tools on your application, it will find the sample code, and it will return it, make it always return true, and then they'll upload it to the sites, the pirate sites, wherever they want to put it. But your real LVL code is still safely inside your application. It gets distributed to many, many people, and then you upsell them all to the Android market, and you make money. If you want to go all out, as I say, this is like if you, you've made an application that you really think the pirates are going to try very, very, very hard to pirate, these are the most extreme methods. You can check tamper resistance. You can get the package manager and check the CRC um, hashes of your files. Make sure that no one's modified them at all. Make sure that your application is not debuggable. Again, you can do this in code, just to flag up a warning to make sure that you don't miss this. You can check your jar files, your APK files. This is all going a bit fast sometimes. You can use reflection to do the same thing. If you think that those previous examples weren't secure enough, you can use reflection to get the CRCs and then check those against yours. Like that. Get the package manager. Shh. Get the package info. Run it all and get it out. Hackers would have to work very, very hard to figure out what this was. They would be looking at every single line of your code. And if you take this, and then you obfuscate it, you should be pretty safe. OK, so in-app billing. I mentioned it before as the way to make money on Android. You get the trust of your users. They install the application. You become a top-grossing application. Like LVL, it's a service provided by the Android market. And there's two types of purchasing on uh, in-app billing in Android. There's managed items and unmanaged items. The managed items we keep track of for you, and every user can only ever purchase them once. So things like game levels, upgrades, features, things that if they reinstall the application on another device, they won't want to have to purchase again. And we'll ensure that it doesn't happen. If they try install it on another device and purchase again, we'll tell you that they already have it. And the second type of um, billing, in-app billing, an Android market, is unmanaged items. Simple. They can then purchase unmanaged items as often as they like. 
uh, voice over IP credits, top-up, spells, whatever it is, that are consumable digital goods. But we don't keep track of that. So you keep track of how much credit they have in your application. They buy more of it. So it becomes quite simple. Is your use case managed or unmanaged? Or can you manage it on your servers? Or do you want us to manage it on ours? Four steps to in-app billing. You do the setup. You make the requests to the market service. You check the responses. And then the security checks. For people who haven't spoken to a service in Android before, you get an Android interface definition file. And this comes, out of your, comes with the in-app billing package. You put it in your project. It generates a stub for you. And then you can call at the bottom here. You can just bind to the Android market service. And once you've done this bind, it will call back to your on-service connected method. And then you can talk directly through the stub that comes from the on-service connected method. You can talk with the Android market. And the first thing you're going to say to the Android market is billing supported. Does this user have billing on their account? Is there an internet connection? And if it is, you can make the request purchase. And on the way back from the request purchase method, you get a pending intent. And when you're ready to show the Android market billing screens, you start that pending intent activity. Android market comes up. It'll complete. It's all handled through the market flow. And then you'll have a response handler. This looks like this. And you'll get the response just here in your onRecieve method. And there's, again, there's sample code for this. And then you're ready to go. Use, um, well, that's the next one. Confirm the change. Once you've received the notification, you send a confirmation message out again, or we'll keep sending the purchase notifications. You need to use the permission, the billing permission. There's nothing wrong with that. Users know that you're going to have in-app billing. We have some uh, test units. If you use the android.test.purchase unit, it means that whilst you're developing, you don't keep needing to go to Google Checkout and canceling every single order. And like paid applications, you can't purchase from your own account. Google Checkout doesn't let users buy things from themselves. So if you do create it, you'll get an error message back, and you should use a different Gmail account for your testing. You manage your products. In the uh, Android market screens, there's an in-app products, which takes you through. Um, a little while back, we added CSV import and export to those if you want to manage a lot of products at one time. OK. And the last couple of little things are the cloud services that we expose now in Android to you guys. The first one is application data backup. And the easiest, the simplest method for this is the shared preferences backup manager. And if you're using shared preferences in your application, you can register them with the shared preferences backup manager. And your shared preferences get synchronized with the Android market servers from that user's application. And then if they install your application on another device, on a tablet, or if they reset their device and reinstall it, the preferences come back down with it. It's just a really nice little extra feature where you can back up your data to the cloud and to the Android market servers. And it's not just shared preferences. That's the simplest example. You can do SQL databases, binary blobs, anything you want. But you would know better how to synchronize that data than us because it's your unique data files. With shared preferences, we provide you a helper class to make it a little bit easier. So another little picture, similar. Backup agent goes to the manager. In this case, the backup manager just registers the fact that you want to uh, keep your backup synchronized. And at some point, it will synchronize all of them with the cloud using our data channels. And finally, the last one is cloud to device messaging. Hopefully, this one's been around for quite a while, so hopefully some of you are using it. The really nice thing about cloud to device messaging is that instead of your application having to poll, we keep a data channel open the whole time. And cloud to device messaging uses our data channel. So it saves on battery life a lot on the device. And it allows you to send messages to either single devices or whole ranges of devices. And you just send a small packet of data to them to say there's a new update or a new whatever. And you register yourself with the cloud to device messaging servers. Your server tells our servers you have a message. It gets broadcast out to the devices. And then the device knows that you've got an update waiting for it. It can go and synchronize and do the data. And using this, you can minimize the amount of times your application appears in that like, list of um, battery-eating applications in the status, in the system settings. And people are all happier. And devices have longer battery life. 
There's quite a lot of apps on Android using C2DM uh, for, for massive distribution of messages. It's a very robust service. Okay, that's uh, the Android market for the users and the Android market for the developers. Maybe this time we have some question time, but thank you very much. <laughs>